Lovely colleagues, please, please don't leave the room. Come and join us. We're about to start uh, a very, very important session following on from the previous uh, outstanding session. I'm Sharon Friel. Uh, I live and work in Australia. I'm the director of the Planetary Health Equity Hothouse at the Australian National University. And really my great pleasure to uh, moderate this session. Uh, I do just want to thank the organizers. This is an outstanding conference. Imagine bringing together climate change, biodiversity, pollution and health. Uh, here at PMAC, where there are so many of the unusual suspects in the room uh, that hold many of the levers to do something about the issues that we're speaking about. Really, uh, really it's so important. So a huge congratulations. We're going to hear about three interconnected crises, as we've already started to this morning. Climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution, and how these relate to human health and well-being and health inequities. And it's, of course, not good, as we've heard so far, uh, the risk for planetary health inequity, the equitable enjoyment of good health in a stable ecosystem is really a major challenge. And as we've heard already this morning, the inequities that come with all of this is really phenomenal. Climate change not only having posed incredible risks for intergenerational inequities, uh, but the added pressure on economic inequities, on social disadvantage, and what that means for health inequities. We're also going to uh, discuss the terrible trajectory that we're currently on uh, towards uncontrolled global warming, and what that means for social stability, for social equity, and for human well-being. And of course, we've heard the terrible projections from the IPCC, and we'll hear more of that. And what we are going to really talk about is addressing some of the major structural issues at play. Addressing this planetary health inequity crisis demands ambitious and urgent action on the structural drivers. We've got to do something about the political economy. We've got to understand it. These drivers of planetary health inequity come in the potent form of the global consumptogenic system, as I've been referring to it, the system of actors, of institutions, of policies, of commercial activities, and of institutional and social norms that absolutely incentivizes and rewards the excessive production and consumption of fossil fuel reliant goods and services, despite the environmental, social and health costs. And yet, despite that unfolding catastrophe that we've been hearing about so far today, there really has been pathetic political and policy attention to transform this consumptogenic system and act in the interest of planetary health equity. So what we're going to do in this session is we're absolutely going to embrace this complexity and talk about how to transform the situation, how to actually get sufficient action that cuts the global greenhouse gas emissions by half, uh, and to address and strengthen the natural systems on which we all depend. We're going to discuss how to embed and mainstream a new economic paradigm, such as donut economics. We'll hear more about that. A different growth model that's based on regenerative and distributive principles, rather than growth for growth's sake. We're going to talk about progressive multi-sectoral adaptation and mitigation, and how to embed that into this new paradigm. We know many of the policies and actions across energy, across food, across how cities are developed and, and built. We've known about that for a very, very long time, but yet little effective remedial action takes place. Many people in this room are going to be very familiar with the social determinants of health and health equity. We've spoken about that a lot at PMAC in the past. We know that good housing, 
transport and social policy is good climate adaptation policy, and in the social determinants language, we know that it's also really good health equity policy. But those decisions are made outside of the health sector and outside of the health deliberations. So we're going to discuss in this session, we're going to discuss how to ensure better coherence, better intersectoral coherence, better interorganizational co coherence, and better coherence between levels from global through to national and subnational. And we know that that's fundamentally a question of governance. And we'll speak about that uh, within the panel. But if we're serious about climate change mitigation, we've got to stop extracting, producing, selling, and burning fossil fuels. Full stop. The energy sector, responsible for about almost three quarters of the emissions that have already caused all of the damage that we've been speaking about. And yet, the stark inequities 10% of the global population still lack access to reliable electricity and over 2 billion people, 2 billion people depend on biomass fuels for their energy and of course 2 billion people exposed to the risks for their indoor air pollution and what that means for health. And we cannot have a discussion about these sorts of issues here in this session without speaking about vested interests. The commercial and the conservative elites who do very, very nicely out of that consumptogenic system. And so it's really important that we discuss the issues of governance, of high and low politics, and fundamentally questions of power. Isn't it interesting that the chief executive of the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, one of the UAE's state-owned oil companies, which has a mission to produce more oil, has been appointed the head of COP28, being held in Dubai later this year. The UN Climate Summit is supposed to be a space where we hold, where the world, we hold polluters to account. But increasingly, it seems that fossil fuel interests are taking control of the processes and shaping it to meet their own needs. So we absolutely have to discuss how we transform this power-laden consumptogenic system to become healthy, equitable, and sustainable. How do we narrate and embed a different possibility? How do we get inside to drive institutional change? How do we shift the norms, the preferences and power in favour of planetary health equity? And to do that, public interest actors like us in this room, we have to be at different tables. We have to be in the energy discussions, we've got to be in the economic discussions, we've got to be in the food system discussions, we've got to be in the infrastructure discussions. Vitally, how do we work in coalitions to articulate and lobby for the necessary structural reforms? This room in PMAC is a collective of incredibly powerful actors from industry, from international organizations, from politics, from NGOs, from civil society, from academia. Collectively, this has to be about using that power. So no pressure on the people that we're about to hear from. Um, we have an incredible panel of speakers. I'm going to begin uh, this session by introducing David Daly, who is uh, Excellency, the EU Ambassador for Thailand. Fantastic to have you speak with us, Ambassador. We then will hear from Professor Johan Rockström, who's the Director uh, for the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. We have 
Jamila Mahmoud, who's Professor and Executive Director of Sunway Centre for Planetary Health in Malaysia. We have Abigail Johnson. I've, I've got a big long list here, Abigail. I've got medical student, climate activist, youth advocate for UNICEF and AstraZeneca Young Leaders Programme uh, from Barbados. I hope joining us online is Alexandra Antonelli, who's the Director of Science for the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew, Kew Gardens, who's also a Professor of Biodiversity at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. And we have Anne Larigordery, uh, who's the Executive Secretary for the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. So I'm sure you agree we have an incredible lineup uh, of speakers. So to begin as Ambassador, we would love to, to hear from you. Excellencies, doctors, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to address you here today. More than a great pleasure, it is a great education or re-education and it is a great motivation to be here with you today. I have to start with an apology because I am in a way an imposter because my very good colleague and friend, the Director General for Environmental Issues in the European Commission, Madam Pink Hoyer, unfortunately cannot be here as advertised. Uh, she suffered an accident recently where she must uh, stay in Brussels. Events like this show, like this conference, show the importance of taking urgent and decisive action to ensure the health of our planet. More than ever before, global health has been impacted by the triple planetary crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution, with particularly heavy burden on the most vulnerable countries and peoples. With these words, there are echoes of what we've already heard this morning. The guy in the film who says, who's told by the guy on the fifth floor, just give up hope. And of course, he does not give up hope. And this conference, the reaction of speakers, the reaction of the kid in the film, and I would suggest the actions that we in Europe are taking, and the actions that others are taking. These are all demonstrations that we're not giving up hope. And the interconnectedness of these three crises, climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, and their linkage to health, this is very much summed up also in what we heard from Dr. Vandana Shiva, that separation is an, an illness of the mind, if I remember correctly. These things must be seen together because of the interrelated nature. And as Dr. Vivian told us from Bolivia, Mother Earth. Everybody, all of us, scholars, civil society, governments, public, private sector, we all should be at the forefront of taking action for a fair and sustainable society, which is increasingly conscious of the health-environment nexus. In the film, the guy says, let's start with ourselves. On the last excellent panel, we heard Andres put the question, which might be embarrassing for us individually, just name the top 10 things that we're doing. The top 10 things that we have changed. Let's start with ourselves. Obviously, climate change, environmental pollution, biodiversity loss, and the unsustainable use of natural resources pose multiple risks to human, animal, and ecosystem health. 
Unlike the pandemic, these risks will stay with us for decades and they are bound to get worse. With the European Union Green Deal, this is our new policy announced two years ago, the EU is stepping up its efforts to protect both the health of both citizens and the planet. Green Deal flagship initiatives aim to achieve climate neutrality, to halt and reverse biodiversity loss, and achieve zero pollution and non-toxic environments. It's also taking a leading role in promoting a global transition to a new type of economic model, a regenerative economy that gives to the planet more than it takes and allows to remain with our planetary boundaries. This requires comprehensive and integrated action across sectors and industry and a whole of government, whole of society approach. Today's conference is one with global, a global perspective, global implications. Tragically, the entire world is now also affected by the illegal and unjustified Russian war in Ukraine. And this war poses particular challenges to the European Union, for example, in the energy sector. But this will not derail our climate ambitions. Instead, the Russian war is accelerating the transition towards a low carbon, zero pollution, more circular economy. The European Commission recently adopted a plan entitled the Repower the EU, where there is a renewed focus on saving energy, on producing cleaner energy, and diversifying our energy supplies. The net effect of the Russian war will be an accelerated transition to a clean energy economy. But what does this EU Green Deal mean in practice? Firstly, we need to protect the integrity of the climate and biodiversity. The EU has set an ambitious course to reach climate neutrality by 2050 and has adopted an ambitious target to reduce by 55% our greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, taking action across the board to adjust our sectoral policies to achieve, achieve these targets. And these targets have been legislated for. At the same time, the last IPCC reports have made it clear that to maintain the 1.5 degree Paris uh, target within reach, we must better uh, protect biodiversity and ecosystems. This is why the agreement of a new global biodiversity framework in Montreal in December at the COP15 is such a major milestone. As we all know, this historical deal for nature includes amongst other targets to protect by 2030, 30% of the planet land and seas and to restore 30% of the planet's degraded terrestrial inland water, coastal and maritime ecosystems. It aims to halt human-induced human extinctions and to step up biodiversity finance, including by eliminating and reforming $500 billion of environmentally damaging subsidies a year. We also need more forceful global action to tackle all forms of pollution and their dramatic impacts on people and the environment. To this end, the European Commission launched a very ambitious Zero Pollution Action Plan for air, water and soil, one of the last building blocks of the European Green Deal, aimed to ensure a healthy and habitable planet, as well as a new chemical strategy for sustainability. The EU ambition is not absolute zero. It is rather an objective to secure that by 2050, pollution is reduced to levels which are no longer expected to be harmful for health and natural ecosystems which respect the planetary boundaries, resulting in a toxic-free environment. This can only be achieved through enhanced international cooperation. Finally, the circular economy. This is a central element of any sustainable future. If we want to ensure planetary health, then we need a different sort of economy. The EU Circular Economy Action Plan proposes that 
a model that reduces the footprint of our consumption and doubles Europe's circular material use rate in the current decade. These are our ambitions. I know that this has a lot of resonance here in Thailand with the BCG model. Let me conclude by also referring to the importance of the One Health approach, which is also at the heart of the new EU global health strategy adopted last November. One Health approach recognizes that health of humans, animals, and the environment are all interlinked. The importance to protect biodiversity and decrease environmental degradation to reduce risks to health, including further zoonosis outbreaks and the challenge of antimicrobial resistance is therefore unquestionable. From this point of view, the EU fully supports the new One Health Joint Plan of Action developed by the Quadripartite, including the WHO, Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, the World Organization for Animal Health, and the United Nations Environment Programme. It's our moment to show the world that we're determined to put nature on the path to recovery for the planet and for our own well-being. What we do now and what we don't do now will have an impact on all generations to come. We can recall Andres's timeline of loving influence, which is how I interpret it, in which a hundred year period is not very long away. So the time for action is indeed now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Ambassador. Really, the, the highlighting that the policy innovation actually that we're seeing across Europe with the, the Green Deal, um, really excellent. Um, I want to move now to, we have a recording from uh, Johan Rockström, so perhaps if we can play that and then we'll come back into the panel discussion. It's a privilege to be with you here to give you scientific updates on the latest science on humanity's ability to live within limits of a stable and resilient Earth system. The juncture now, at the end of 2022, is unprecedented. We must recognize that we are facing not one crisis, the climate crisis, but also an ecological crisis, which is interacting with the climate crisis, but that we also have hopefully a tail end of a pandemic, but that we have a rise, another hockey stick of pandemics increasing over the past 30 years as a reflection, as a manifestation of the Anthropocene, that we as humanity, another dominating force of change on planet Earth, not only having environmental impacts, but hitting back on health implications because COVID-19 is a zoonosis. All pandemics are zoonosis and they are spillovers of wild uh, viruses from wild animals to domestic animals to people and a reflection of rising risks with unsustainable exploitation of natural habitats. On top of this, we have a situation of rising instability in the world because of geopolitics, the war in Ukraine, uh, erosion of trust and ability for collective action exactly at the time when we need collective action and, and governance um, on, on a trust-based and, and effective way more than ever. That's where we are, and that is why it's so urgent to now try to find pathways towards a transformative future. This is at a point where we have 1.2 degrees Celsius of global mean temperature rise, we have the warmest years ever on record over the past decade, the warmest temperature on Earth since we left the last ice age. But it's also entering the sixth mass extinction of species. We're losing ecological functions that keeps not only life support in terms of food, energy, fiber, fresh water, air stable, but also keeping the climate stability intact. We're risking to lose 1 million out of the recorded 8 million species, 70% almost of the populations of mammals have declined since 1970. This is undoubtedly a point of high risk. And we have the evidence here, how we are gradually reducing along a very important, but also dangerous, slippery path 
towards losing resilience and stability in the earth system recently with uh, colleagues at the Potsdam Institute Kirsten Tonicke and others we produced uh, the 10 must knows in biodiversity science and one of those are on planetary health the number two here the recognition that biodiversity loss climate change is now integral also to humanity's health and humanity's ability to navigate the future just one example with air pollutants now shortening the lives of up to eight nine million people per year unhealthy food shortening life of in the order of 10 to 11 million people per year and that we have more and more evidence that over the next 50 years we might have up to 3 billion people um, living in regions that have above 30 degrees Celsius in global mean surface temperature, which is a physiological threshold that pushes humans across a tipping point in terms of ability to cope with heat stress. So this is a recipe for instability. We now need to be stewards of the entire planetary system. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in the sixth assessment concluded that this is the case. This is the high level conclusion that the evidence is now unequivocal. We're causing climate change, but it's threatening the health of the planet and human well being, and the window is rapidly closing for a safe landing. But not only that, it also concludes that it won't be enough to just decarbonize the global energy system. We also need to take care of the living parts of the biosphere. We need to have thriving nature to have a chance of a safe landing because of the carbon sequestration and the ability to buffer heat and stress from climate forcing. We recently had COP27, which unfortunately did not take uh, make progress on this urgency. We know that we have to cut global emissions by half by 2030, continue to cutting them by half every decade to a net zero world economy by 2050. COP27 focused on loss and damage, a really important agenda item, but it's not enough to only look backwards and repair what has been damaged. We also need to avoid to have to, uh, to avoid a situation when we cannot afford paying the invoices of loss and damage in the future. So scientifically, the most important message to COP27 is that 1.5 degrees Celsius written into the Paris Agreement is a limit. It's not a target. It's not a goal. It's not negotiable. It is really a scientifically evidence-based limit, a planetary boundary. We're following a pathway that takes us to 2.5 degrees Celsius by the end of this century, a disaster pathway, scientifically unequivocally so. We haven't been there for the past 4 million years. But the most important thing is that we have now science showing that when we exceed beyond 1.5, we put human health and stability of ecosystems and societies at risk. We have just published in science the first large quantitative assessment of all the climate tipping element systems you see them here the 16 on the x-axis in red embers diagram the confidence levels in science the darker the red the higher the certainty of crossing the threshold and you see the 1.5 degrees celsius line here and the black dotted lines are the average assessments and what you see which is really a key insight from science coming out recently in, in our evidence base is that five of these tipping element systems are likely to cross their tipping points already at 1.5 degrees Celsius. And these are not small systems. We're talking about the Greenland ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet. We're talking about all the tropical coral reef systems. We're talking about boreal permafrost abruptly thawing. And we're talking about the barren sea ice. Just the two big ice sheets, Green ice sheet and West Antarctic ice sheet, hold 10 meter sea level rise. So when we conclude that exceeding 1.5 degrees Celsius can trigger multiple tipping elements, this is a, a fundamental insight from science that has to be taken really serious. And not only that, the Earth system is coupled. So we have more and more scientific evidence of cascade risks. The green ice sheet releases cold, fresh water when it's melting fast because of three times faster warming in the northern parts of the Arctic. That fresh water slows down the overturning of heat in the North Atlantic, well established, pushes the monsoon further south, can explain why we get less rainfall and more forest fires and droughts over the Amazon rainforest, another tipping element system, which loses more carbon, but also means that warm surface water, saline surface water, is held in the Southern Ocean, which can explain why the West Antarctic ice sheet is melting faster than expected. So what's happening in the Arctic 
is connected through cascades between tipping elements to Antarctica. This is now increasingly in the scientific literature and, and, and an understanding of why we need precaution. So the pathway forward is increasingly scientifically very clear. We need to follow this great path of cutting emissions by half every decade to a net zero world economy by 2050, but also a food system transition from the dark brown wedge here, emitting carbon, to a food system that sequesters carbon, the regenerative transformation, scaling carbon capture in orange, and maintaining, securing, safeguarding carbon sinks in intact nature in green on land and blue in ocean. It's a global sustainability transformation for safe landing on climate. This just proves that it's a sustainability transition. We need, therefore, planetary boundaries because we are in the Anthropocene and the Holocene, the last 12,000 years since we left the last ice age, when we've developed everything that we call civilizations today is an extraordinarily stable state of the earth system, which we are now putting at risk because tipping points, if they are across their thresholds, will lead to irreversible changes that can self-amplify and continue uh, taking over the warming pathway towards a hothouse Earth. Planetary boundaries provides us with scientifically based uh, safe thresholds, boundaries within which we have a safe operating space. In 2015, we identified and confirmed the nine big planetary boundary systems. And these are not only climate change, it's also biodiversity, fresh water, land systems, the overloading of nitrogen and phosphorus, but also, of course, air pollutants, chemical overloading, the protective ozone layer, and a stable ocean. Four of nine boundaries were assessed to be outside of the safe operating space in 2015. We're now working on the third scientific assessment of the planetary boundaries. And what you see to the right here is not only the four original, climate change, biodiversity loss, land system change, and overloading of reactive nitrogen and phosphorus, but also freshwater use, but also chemical pollution. So we are unfortunately still sliding in the wrong direction. We're still losing resilience in the Earth system when we need it more than ever to keep not least the climate system stable because 50% of the emission of greenhouse gases from fossil fuel burning are actually absorbed by intact nature. So despite this transgression of the planetary boundaries, the healthy part of nature is still helping us but we're losing that resilience. That's why we've set up the Earth Commission since three years being an attempt of, of assessing all the science-based targets for the Earth system boundaries in both safety, but also justice. So we're trying to define quantitatively the guardrails for humanity's future on Earth that can not only keep the planet stable, but also keep healthy people uh, able to have thriving and equitable lives in the future. If you take those science-based targets, they get connected to exponential roadmaps. We have just one of those on climate, the recognition that we have to now have exponential transformative change to have a safe landing at net zero carbon emissions by 2050. The interesting thing is that we have more and more evidence in sector by sector by sector that the wedges of how to cut emissions by half every decade can be accomplished. It's not utopia. It's not fantasy. It's scaling. It's about taking the knowledge we have, technologies we have, practices that exist, behavioral changes that are necessary, and start scaling them and providing the economic policies and the regulatory frameworks that enable industry and communities to, to adopt the attractive uh, zero carbon pathways to the future. So that's quite interesting that there's nothing suggesting that we cannot cut emissions by half by 2030 if we shift away from investing in fossil fuel-based unsustainable practices into sustainable practices. Right as we speak, we have the world gathering in Montreal for the COP15, the Paris moment on nature. We have been scientifically trying to guide this from a planetary boundary perspective, supporting the fact that we've reached the Edward O. Wilson point of half Earth. The planetary boundary on land expansion is that we need to keep around 50% of intact land areas in, in natural, as natural as possible state. But we have transformed 50% already in current cities, infrastructure, roads, and agriculture. So basically, the scientific message is zero. And that's what you see here in the nature positive science advice that we have 
uh, from the scientific community and the civil society community um, offered into the Montreal COP15 negotiations. Halt the loss of nature from 2020 onwards. We will still continue losing nature. That is, we're not naive in this sense. So the aim is to restore to a point of net positive by 2030 and then move towards full recovery. That's the beauty with nature. If you don't lose species, if you don't completely destroy ecosystems, they have a phenomenal regenerative capacity if we are wise stewards. I really hope that we're able to, to um, get this, this Paris equivalent of nature, so 1.5 degrees Celsius for climate, being a net zero loss of nature equivalent for biodiversity and ecosystems, put these together and we have an agenda for planetary health for people and planet in order to give future generations a chance to thrive on Earth as well. Now, can we accomplish this? Well, I would close by arguing that we are just at this kind of pinnacle of a journey that has been uphill for decades, but we do have momentum in terms of solutions, in terms of awareness, in terms of economic policies and institutional ability, but we're still having counterforces, vested interest, geopolitical instability, inflation and economics going the wrong direction, and more and more vulnerable communities being hit very hard by extreme events. Just take this year's disaster, Pakistan, 30% of its surface area underwater, 30 million people affected, over 2,000 losing their lives. Here we can talk of tens of billions of US dollars in loss and damage. These are the kind of impacts that not only undermine nations' abilities to rise and transform themselves to a sustainable future, it of course also risks undermining trust and, and collective action across all nations in the world. So here, we all have a responsibility to help push this, this ball across a positive threshold to unleash uh, irreversible social transformations that can take us towards the planetary health that we all need and are aspiring for. So with that, good luck with your deliberations at the PMAC 2023. Uh, thank you very much. Lovely. Well, excellent as always. So we have momentum. It's about scaling. How are we going to do it? So I'd like to come over to uh, Jamila and Abigail uh, now. I'm not sure if we have our uh, other colleague joining us online. Uh, if you would like to, Jamila, yeah. Thank you very much, Sharon. Now, when I first got the brief uh, to come to PMAC, which is, by the way, a fantastic conference, so congratulations, I was asked to really respond to Johan's remarks earlier, which you all heard. And of course, I agree with everything he says. You know, it's based on science, it's research, it's got a healthy dose of analysis, there's very little to argue about. So I think that, you know, what I want to do is really say, what comes next, as, as you say? How do we take it to scale, as Johan pointed out uh, in his speech as well? Now, it's clear from science, but more importantly and immediately, it's clear from what's going on around us. But where is the sense of urgency? I will be frank, sorry, it's my way, for those who know me well, and tell you that I'm actually getting impatient and I'm tired of endless debate and discussion, lengthy delay and inaction that we've seen from many, many of the large conferences that have been held over the years. But I'm in a gathering with many friends, doctors like me, health professionals, and I want to remind all of us that Ipsos 22, Global Trustworthiness Index, reveals that people like us, the health professionals and the scientists, are still considered to be the most trustworthy professions. So people trust us, or most people trust us. They have belief in us. And if they trust us, then I hope that it follows that they will also trust what we tell them, even if it's unpleasant. But there are some real challenges for us to do that. 
So this week, the meeting of medical and health minds, one of the largest in the world, has landed on the right language, setting a new agenda at the nexus of climate change, biodiversity, and environment. And I emphasize the word setting. But I want to warn all of us that we will stand little chance of achieving that goal if we look at how our sessions are described with words that, use, that are used to dampen expectations. The objective of this, of this session is to share examples. By attending this session, you will understand, hear from a panel, see real-world examples. The session will examine, bring in lessons from, consider the way, examine strategies. This language denotes caution, wariness rather than boldness and courage. Our deliberations need to use action-oriented objective statements. Push for, urge change, deliberate and advocate for concrete actions. I come from a new 18-month-old Center for Planetary Health, which I lead, and we've been trying to figure out why the health community seems to be punching below its collective weight. Why is it so cautious in a time when the connections between the health of the planet and the people living on it have never been starker? Why are we, the trusted community, so afraid to be bold we have seen how we have come together with the pandemic, the, the, the amazing collective minds that have created a vaccine over a short period of time. Why can't we do the same now? So our sense is that we are past time to get our house in order and our act together and to emphasize what joins rather than divide us. Our debates endlessly about global health one Health, Planetary Health, have surprised me and my colleagues. The largely academic discussions about which one is better, the most comprehensive, the purest. We need to rapidly work our way through these debates. Nature doesn't care about our divisions. Nature needs the health community to work as one in protection of its health interests and the health interests of everything that depends on it. And I'm worried that, sorry, I'm falling into the trap of using placatory language as well, so let me try again. I am alarmed, furious, and incensed that following the pandemic and all that we learned, we are not making a greater impact in addressing the existential crisis that the planet, Mama Earth, and everything living on it now are subject to. The planetary crisis is a health crisis. Johan has made that very plain and clear. But then where is the collective, united, and potentially powerful voice of the health profession writ large? So let me suggest that we focus our energies, our frustrations and pent-up energy on a couple of areas for engagement. Firstly, we need to address the crisis in governance. And I don't just mean politicians. I mean all of us, for what we respond to, submit to, react to, in terms of trying to get a grip on what's going on. If we take the section, section objectives from this conference, for example, these are all laudable targets, but we must ask ourselves, what is it we are trying to do now to change the way we are and to influence those who govern us? health ministers, the World Health Assembly, the various health funding instruments, what do we need to say to them that will accelerate their actions to turn rhetoric into reality? As a health professional, as someone in the field of planetary health, we committed to a strong partnership with Healthcare Without Harm, for example. We need to change the way health practice continues. We need to think about how we decarbonize health systems. If we don't start with ourselves, how are we going to influence others? I come from Malaysia, the center is young, but what we want to do is not just sit in a room of scientists and academics, but make sure that whatever research is done is translated into policy and action. And we've done it, influence the development plans to include language on planetary health, climate change. 
We are working with the government agencies to make sure that we have a planetary health roadmap, influencing the Ministry of Health to set up a climate and health, environment and health unit, so that we can all address it together. This is how we take it to scale, at least at national level. And at local level, we're also trying to demonstrate the circular regenerative economics, building a city, or rather transforming a city in, in Malaysia to follow the donut economic model of Kate Rayworth, so that we can show it can be done from local, community, national, regional. Secondly, and really building on the first excellent uh, plenary, we need effective, coherent, and relevant communications in an era of confusion we live in a time where people are facing what UNDP's excellent human development report in 2022 describes as an uncertainty complex caused by three factors. Dangerous planetary change, we know that. The transition to new ways of organizing industrial societies and the intensification of political and social polarization. So these factors have significant health impacts how is the health community engaging with media and social media to get key messages across? How do we bring science and communications together? I recently read a seminal report, which I hope all of you will read um, at the World Economic Forum. It was called The Breakthrough Effect, How to Trigger a Cascade of Tipping Points to Accelerate to the next Net Zero Transition. It's such an easy report to read. It's based on solid academic research, written in accessible language in joint collaboration between Systemic, Exeter University, and the Bezos Earth Fund. Can we not come together to do the same? Turn Lancet commentaries into accessible, actionable reports that lend themselves well to social media messaging and tweets, TikTok videos. Mind you, people are watching TikTok videos. Policies are being made based on what people are watching on TikTok videos. We might not like it, but that's the reality, that the addictions faced by our young people mean that they get information by their screens. We need to be in that space. And finally, we need an education revolution. We're reprioritizing what our next generation learn about, about what they learn about, needs to be more than a matter of chance. Getting planetary health or One Health or whatever you want to call it onto the curriculum in schools, universities and other seats of learning should be our collective priority. At our university, we have piloted planetary health curriculum as a module for seven weeks. And in 2024, every student or rather from 2024, every student undergraduate enrolling to university must complete a seven week course on planetary health and community service, irrespective of discipline, otherwise they will not graduate. We are now also experimenting with young children in organizations and schools. But I want to bring us back to why we are concerned about all this, and it's about humanity, it's about people. And I always quote Rosamund Kissy Debra. For those who are aware, Rosamund lost her daughter, Ella, from uh, air pollution and a very severe respiratory illness. And Ella, if she was alive, would have turned 19 a few days ago. Rosamond fought very, very hard to get the death certificate of Ella to be changed from asthma to toxic air pollution. She fought for many years and she won. And she's now on the road to really rallying for an Ella's law on clean air for UK and Wales, I mean, uh, England and Wales. Rosamond spoke many times about this, even in PMAC, I think, before. And one thing she lamented when we conversed was, why is it that Ella remains the only person in the world with a death certificate with toxic air pollution as a cause? Weren't we, as medical students and doctors, taught that we should write the cause of death as really being the real cause of death? Then why are we hesitant? Why has medical education not evolved to take into account the real challenges we face today? I checked the air pollution index 
just before I came in here, and it's 176. One, I might be wrong, it might be 126, but it's unhealthy. So my respected friends and colleagues, I'm not pretending that anything is easy. I do not intend to cause offense by being frank, but talking to ourselves will not generate the transition to a sustainable planet. The medical community is amazing, wondrous, and an example of science meeting humanity. But it's time for a rethink that maximizes this vital relationship. And I hope you agree. Thank you very much. Marvelous, Jamila. A, a wonderful reminder of the importance of, of health professions uh, and that power of education in, in many different ways. So let me keep us moving. Abigail, over to you for your reflections. Uh, so I echo the sentiments that were shared by both Jamila and Johan. I think one of the things that really resonated with me from what Johan would have mentioned was the, the repeated well, repetition that 1.5 is a limit and it's not a target. And being from a small island developing state in the Caribbean, that is our lived reality. That is the difference between life and death for us. So I think that that really brought it home for me. And the, the problem that then lies with that is that national solutions to global problems do not work. I, I could wake up today and I could tell myself I would never turn on the electricity in my house. I would never get in the car. I would cycle everywhere. And that would do very little to, to alter the effects of the, of the climate crisis. Uh, it, we do require a multi-sectoral approach. It requires both the public sector and the private sector. It, it, it has to involve civil society organizations. It has to go to the grassroots organizations. You have to go to the level of the small farmer who may just be selling tomatoes and cucumbers to, just, to help, um, just to help his family along to the level of the government. It, the, the fight in the climate crisis, it, 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 cannot, it cannot be done by the independent efforts of Abigail or Jamila or anybody that's here currently. It cannot work just by the efforts of small island developing states or those who are, just, or those who are being impacted the most, the most vulnerable persons in the most vulnerable countries. It needs everybody to act. And I think that, that when, when Johan mentioned the, the level of action that is required, that, that really brought it home for me. So I think that's one of my major takeaways from that session just now. Thank you. Uh, I'm so glad you reminded us of that importance of it's not about the in, just the individual responsibility, but real structural uh, action, really important. And one of the things, um, so uh, Jamila, you also mentioned it and uh, Johan sort of in passing, you know, the idea of um, Kate Raworth's donut economics. And I think that goes fundamentally, uh, Abigail, to what you're sort of pointing towards is you know, the importance of st structural, uh, fundamental change. It's not just about us turning on and off the lights, etc. And so Kate Roberts' donut economics, which is you know really fundamentally putting the the planet and and people at the center of that. Abigail, in your reflection, how do we get that sort of uh, economic paradigm shift? You know, that's a you know, many people in this room have been speaking about that forever, and um, we've been speaking about that forever in the social determinants of health equity. Now with planetary health equity, do you see any possibilities for? You know how how do we make, how do we change the economic paradigm? Small question. If I if I had the answer, I probably would be working towards it. Um, but I do think that we do need to have increased pre pressure put on developing countries so that they can uh, actually try to well not try do stop what it is that they are doing, decrease their greenhouse gases emissions. I think we we are caught in a situation often where. The, the minority will have their say and the majority will have their way. And unfortunately for us, the small island developing states, um, the countries such as Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, the one, um, even Pakistan, um, the countries who are most severely impacted by the climate crisis, we speak, but it seems as though we are not being heard. 
And truly, I don't know how it is that we will get our point across. I mean, you can repeat it. You can state, you can state these things repeatedly. This is not information that is unknown to anybody that is here, any, any prime minister or president of any country. But what is it that is causing persons to not act? And of course, it could be the economic impacts of, of action, uh, the, the economic impacts of, of actually not getting in that income from uh, fossil, burning fossil fuels, or even the money that you have to input to assist in the adaptation and uh, building a more resilient infrastructure in uh, le um, less developed countries. But it's, it's a, it, it requires a multi-factorial uh, approach, I should say. I'll leave it as that. I'm not sure if Jamila has anything to add. <laughs> Jamila, do you want to, I mean, you, I suppose the, the power of the health profession and the collective voice to call for some of these kind of paradigm shifts, do you see hope of that? Maybe if I can just address the donut economics question first. I think for those who are not familiar with donut economics, Basically, Kate Raworth described a new regenerative economic model where it looks like a donut because it has two rings. And the outer ring is the planetary boundaries, which is the ecological ceiling that we should not exceed. But the inner ring is actually the social floor. It's well and good to say, yes, let's not pollute, let's not cross the planetary boundaries. But developing countries still need to meet the needs of health and education um, and justice and, and other housing, shelter, all that, right? So, uh, and creating that safe space for humanity. So it basically the internal ring is your sustainable development goals. So how do we live that way? Now, it's, it, it really requires leadership, and it again comes back to governance, to actually say the GDP model doesn't work, right? It, it must be a different kind of economic model that's much more based on equity. And, and you know, people, young people in this room, please, it's your voice, right, you, to, to drive that change. So I think when you're speaking about, you asked me the question around um, health professionals. I think health professionals have great influence. You know, everyone who's a leader has a doctor who attends to him or her. And this is why I'm saying that we need to punch above our weight. We have influence. We have, you know, the ability to 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 connect with policymakers, uh, with with activists, with everyone. Uh, and I think we need to use that collective voice and 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 show the science and the evidence, but also the empathy, the humanity that the health profession is is you know, is really a, a core of our work. Is about you know humanity and lives. So. It's difficult. We need economists in the medical conference. Um, and, you know, uh, and just to give a shout out that next year will be the Planetary Health Summit in Malaysia. So I will give you more information. But we need not just ourselves in these meetings. We need the finance people. We need the energy sector. We need the economists. We need the, you know, policymakers, the educational sector to be listening because this is all intersecting. And, and this is why, you know, the planetary health approach is about a multi-systems approach to solving the complex problems. Lovely, thank you. Um, Ambassador, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot because I think this, the, you know, the intersectoral and it's not, you know, it sits at sometimes at the very high level of, of politics. It requires seeing across these systems and, and you're in... Such your role uh, allows you to to do that. I, I'm looking for hope here. Uh, the, the the possibilities. You know how how did something like the EU Green Deal come about? That was seeing across these sectoral uh, divides. It does embrace quite a different economic paradigm. We can argue about the sort of specifics of it, but. Do you, in, in your role, you must be seeing this navigation between different sector, sectoral boundaries? Uh, yes. Um, thank you for that uh, question. I think that uh, th there are a number of things that, uh, that occur. First is, of course, if any of this was easy, it would already have been done. It is not uh, easy. And when looking at 
you know, what have we done? Uh, what has, what can we look to as progress? We have to accept that progress is slow and hopefully incremental. That we don't, that we have an upward trajectory that doesn't ever go backward. Um, in this regard, uh, if you look at the European Union, um, you can look at the reduction that we've made on climate change indices, greenhouse gases, emissions, and so on, over the last 20, 30 years, and it's impressive. But um, exactly on the question, how has this come about? Why do we have a Green Deal? There are um, political motivations which have translated into legislation, and there are motivations that come uh, from the marketplace as well. So political motivations, uh, this is not new. Climate change is not new. We've been talking about it for now decades. But over that period, we've seen, uh, at least in, in Europe, we've seen a progression whereby uh, the political voices in favor of clim in addressing climate change and environmental issues and biodiversity and so on, those political voices have gone, have made a transition from being um, voices on the margin politically into voices which are cross-party uh, and absolutely mainstream. So this is one part of the explanation. And um, this can be tracked in terms of the political evolutions of different policies on the EU side. On the market side is the realization that increasingly European consumers want to know more about the products they're consuming. They want to know uh, how products have been made from an ecological, from an environmental point of view. They want to know how they've been made from a human point of view, question of human rights and so on. And all of this is, uh, there is the, the legislation that's in the Green Deal is where these two, the marketplace and the political, converge. And that, that is the, the result. And so we have um, new legislation on things like deforestation and on um, the, the climate border adjustment mechanism. It's a, a very unwieldy term. But that's what, you, that's what you, you see coming together. The political awareness that has been growing over decades, which has become mainstream, and the marketplace. Um, and these are both very powerful um, uh, forces. But they have to be harnessed in the right direction. And in Europe, I think we can, we can be uh, modestly proud that uh, we are harnessing these forces in the right direction. But there's absolutely no room for complacency uh, on anyone's part. Yeah, thank you. Lovely, lovely analysis of that sort of political economy, as it were. So I do want to, I'm conscious of time. People are uh, wondering why we're still going. So remember, we started late, so we are going to run over. I know it's sort of us uh, between you and, and lunch. Uh, but I do just want to go to the second uh, recorded talk that we have uh, because I want to move us into this intersection with both climate change and biodiversity. Obviously, we're talking about that nexus. Uh, so we're going to hear from Anne Largardere, uh, I mentioned as the Executive Secretary for the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem. And just to note for colleagues in the room that Alexandra Antonelli has been listening online all this time, and he will join us uh, after we've heard from Anne. So if we could play the recording, please. Good morning to all. It's a great uh, pleasure to be able to uh, give a keynote uh, address to PMAC 2023. I will be focusing uh, my remarks on the biodiversity crisis and how it relates in particular to climate change and to health-related uh, issues. 
Everything I say will be drawn uh, from the work of IBES, the intergovernmental platform on biodiversity and ecosystem uh, services. So what is uh, biodiversity? Well, biodiversity is all life on earth in its great uh, diversity from the diversity of individuals within a species, which is the genetic diversity, to the diversity among all species on earth, to the third level, which is the diversity among ecosystems. Uh, think about uh, the Arctic tundra ecosystems or tropical forests or even soil microfauna and flora. All of this is uh, biodiversity, including all of the interconnections uh, between uh, these uh, individuals. So the uh, IBES Global Assessment of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which came out in 2019, concluded that nature is being degraded at a rate and scale unprecedented in human history. It gave many numbers, but in particular, one really struck consciences around the world, which is with the one that is on your screen, one million of plants and animal species out of an estimated total of about 8 million species are at risk of extinction. So why uh, should we care about this and why should we take urgent action to solve this issue? Well, the first thing to say really is that we should care because this is the right thing to do because all non-human uh, life on this planet has a value uh, of its own. But having said that, uh, we should also care and we should take action because the loss of biodiversity affects the way ecosystems function. It lowers their capacity to function properly and that has a negative impact on a number of critical contributions that we people derive from nature. As this slide shows here, over the past 50 years, uh, we have been losing all of the regulating contributions, that's number one to 10 on your screen, as well as all of the non-material contributions, number 15 to 18 on your screen. So 14 out of the 18 contributions that are critical have been uh, declining. That includes the capacity of ecosystems to pollinate our crops or to control the emergence of diseases or even to control uh, the capacity to mitigate uh, against uh, climate change. That's the regulating contributions, but also non-material contributions, uh, such as the capacity of ecosystems to, to give us a sense of belonging or identity of all of the physical and emotional psychological experiences that we derive from nature and that have an immense value for all of us around the world. So the material contributions are those that have been uh, increasing over the past 50 years. So that has increased uh, the food, the energy, the materials at the expense of all of the other uh, contributions. So why, what, what can we do to uh, restore uh, biodiversity and these uh, contributions that are so critical to us? Well, uh, it is important it is critical to address of course the causes of this loss of biodiversity and the global uh, assessment concluded that there are five direct causes which it ranked in order of uh, importance starting with land use change deforestation urbanization in particular and second comes the over exploitation of organisms uh, such as overfishing which is the first cause direct cause of biodiversity loss uh, in the ocean the third cause is climate change. The fourth one is pollution in all of its forms, including from agriculture through the overuse of pesticides uh, and fertilizers. And the fifth cause is invasive alien species. And these direct uh, causes, of course, are related to underlying causes which relate to what us people do, the decisions we make, our economy, the consumption choices uh, we make, our institutions, our governance, all of these social and economic uh, considerations which are anchored into our values and behaviors and it is those that really need to be changed. So how do we do that? 
what kind of actions can we take to change and put us on a path uh, to, to recovery towards uh, more sustainable pathways? Well, uh, the first thing to do, of course, is to protect land and seas that have not yet been uh, destroyed. That is why uh, the decision that was recently taken by COP15 of the Biodiversity Convention in Montreal just a couple of weeks ago is so crucial. That is the decision to protect 30% of our land and sea areas on the planet. That is quite uh, considerable if it is done properly. And by properly, it means that those areas that are protected will need to be ecologically representative, well-managed, well-resourced. The discussion about the funding was quite crucial, of course, uh, in the approval of the new framework. And they also need to be well-connected in the context of climate change to allow those species who uh, can migrate to do so. But of course, uh, we also need to take into account the 70% of the planet that would not be under protection. So protecting alone is not enough. What needs to be done in addition to that is to place biodiversity literally at the center of all of the uh, economic uh, sectors uh, around uh, the world. Uh, and in order to do so, one important uh, action is to transform agriculture, fisheries, and food systems. We know that agriculture is the single most uh, damaging human activity towards uh, biodiversity because uh, it takes uh, over natural habitats and also because it is a form of pollution and of climate change. We know how to do that. Uh, we know how to... Uh, uh, perform uh, practices that are more of those of agroecology to reduce the use of pesticides, fertilizers, conserve soil biodiversity, rebuild overfish stocks, reduce those subsidies uh, that uh, sustain um, intensive agriculture that uses too much pesticides. Uh, we need to promote healthier diets, those that use less meat, fish, more plant-based, reducing food waste and improving food market uh, transparency so as to allow uh, citizens to be better uh, informed and becoming themselves uh, actors of change. So those are some of the actions to transform uh, agriculture. But there are uh, other uh, sectors uh, that also need to be uh, transformed. And, and one of them is uh, health policies in the context of the focus uh, of this PMAC uh, conference uh, on this. And so uh, IBES in 2020 came up uh, with a report on uh, biodiversity and pandemics. And it really showed that the emergence of pandemics is uh, not only an issue related uh, to uh, the medical sectors, but also an issue related uh, to uh, biodiversity. It showed how, in particular, pandemics are microbes that are found uh, in nature, in our natural environment, mostly on animals and mostly in biodiversity-rich areas, such as, in particular, in the tropics. It also showed that these microbes can spill over from infected animals into people when the conditions are right to do so. That is when they are brought into contact with infected animals because of human driven activities, typically large scale land use projects such as uh, deforestation. There are many uh, vir viruses that are circulating uh, in the world and a very large proportion of those you see here on the screen, between 600 and 800,000 viruses have the potential like the coronavirus to infect humans. So the report showed uh, that we can escape this era of pandemics, but that it will require a major shift from reaction which is the medical response once uh, the viruses have emerged from the environment to a prevention, which is about better understanding the biodiversity, the environmental ecological context for the emergence of diseases and to try to avoid uh, this uh, emergence. So in order to do that, we need to better act 
on the direct drivers of the emergence, with, which are in particular deforestation, wildlife trade. But we also need to be putting in place some monitoring systems that will detect hotspots of emergence and, and perhaps take actions such as avoiding to carry out this large scale deforestation or land use projects in those areas where, uh, where there are high loads of the types of viruses that could then spread uh, into people. And we also need to review our institutions to make changes in order to build uh, important uh, links uh, between different communities that have not uh, normally worked together, the medical, the veterinary and forestry conservation community. This is called the One Health approach so that we better understand how to prevent uh, the emergence of uh, diseases. And then, um, and finally, um, we need to uh, address uh, biodiversity as a issue which is tightly coupled to uh, climate change. So we need to put biodiversity at the center of all of the policies uh, that are uh, ad addressing uh, climate change. And uh, that is also one of the conclusion of the first ever collaboration between IBES and uh, IPCC on the linkages between biodiversity and climate change that uh, came out in 2021. There were three um, main conclusions. I don't have much time to go into the details. The first one, of course, was that climate change is having already a strong effect on biodiversity. This is very well documented, thousands of publications. Think, for example, about the impact on coral reefs of climate change. The second uh, key conclusion is that there are solutions that benefit to both climate change and uh, biodiversity, the so-called nature-based uh, solution. Everything that protects, that restores uh, nature increases its potential to absorb uh, more uh, carbon in the uh, atmosphere. The same is true for all of the uh, agroecological uh, actions that we can take towards uh, transforming our agriculture, which are good for biodiversity and good for climate. However, there are some measures uh, such as this large scale land-based mitigation measures, which are currently taken to address climate change, which are negative uh, for uh, biodiversity. I'm talking about the massive deployment of bioenergy crops, which are starting to destroy uh, natural habitats, as well as tree planting schemes, which, if not done according to agroecological principles, can lead to many issues such as pollution, drought, also displacement of uh, indigenous uh, people and should therefore uh, be uh, avoided. So in conclusion, um, and to leave a message of, of hope, of course, uh, it is not too late to act on all of those issues. Uh, but a transformative change is needed to achieve sustainability. Everyone has a role to play. Uh, it is important to uh, restore and to protect land and seas, to promote uh, the integration of biodiversity in all sectors, including health, since protection alone uh, will not be enough. And it is in particular uh, important to look at climate change uh, policy through the lens uh, of uh, biodiversity. So overall, uh, our options are uh, more than ever uh, in uh, nature. Nature has the potential uh, to solve a number of our crises, including climate change, including some of our health issues, such as the emergence of uh, pandemics. But in order to do that, we need to really invest much more in nature, in its protection, in its sustainable use, so as to put us back to a path towards uh, reaching all of our sustainable development goals. So uh, with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Lovely, thank you. So we're going to have the, the final remarks from Alexandra Antonelli. He's been with us online all this time. So 
Alexandra, I hope you can see and hear us. Yes, lovely. Uh, so you've got the the final five minutes or so. You're between us and, and lunch, so no pressure. Um, but really, just your expertise in biodiversity, I think, and you, how what this looks like in, in practice is, is also incredibly important. So over to you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, good morning from here in Europe. Uh, it's been a fascinating session so far and impossible to disagree with anything that has been said by Anne and the other presenters and experts we heard today. So what I'd like to do now is, uh, before you go on to lunch, I'm afraid, is to briefly add some personal reflections, mainly from Global South perspectives, uh, given my personal background as a biodiversity scientist from Brazil and South America, and international work we're doing at the Robert Tonagarnes Q uh, in the UK, which really involves research and conservation through partnerships in more than 100 countries. I'd also like to add um, a bit more on the importance of plants and nature to help us tackle the great challenge we're facing today. So, um, as we have heard during the session, uh, climate, biodiversity and pollution are really interconnected. And this is how I envision uh, those links uh, in a very simple way. So. On the, on the left hand side, uh, it's really the negative trajectory of biodiversity and species loss and genetic diversity loss, um, but also an increase uh, in pollution and uh, increase in temperatures. And what we think and believe is that uh, science can really help identifying the, the natural solutions to those problems. And we, we can recover so that in the end, we'll reach a living, healthy planet for us, but also for all species on this planet. And I think understanding those links is really absolutely crucial. Uh, and the triple crisis is a good uh, metaphor for that. But I must say that um, in my personal experience, uh, being at um, COP, sorry, my, my personal experience being at uh, many different uh, COP meetings, for instance, when it comes to biodiversity, climate, uh, pollution is the challenge that gets the least attention and um, its effects on climate, biodiversity and human health. And this is despite the very clear impact of polluting activities, such as gold mining, uh, which has caused mercury contamination around the world, including hotspots in tropical ecosystems in South America, where I come from, but also in Southeast Asia, where you are. And uh, we know that mercury uh, concentrations tend to increase in organisms at higher traffic levels, and that's, for instance, fish and, and, and birds. And mercury is a neurotoxicant. It's known to affect uh, the motor abilities and reproduction. And by influencing top predators, it also causes drastic deterioration of regional food webs. So um, mercury is, of course, just one among the hundreds of thousands, at least 350,000 uh, chemicals that are in current use. And we also know that about 40 new sorts of chemicals are being developed by industry every single hour. So the question is um, that we know pollution is affecting uh, nature and biodiversity. And it is quite fascinating to actually consider that pollution may have an even bigger impact to biodiversity today than climate change. Uh, even though our knowledge about um, the impact of pollution and chemicals, uh, especially um, chemical pollutants, is having on different species. But for instance, uh, the IUCN release assessment, so that's the I International Union for Conservation of Nature, assesses the threat to different species. and out of the 83,000 animal species that have been assessed so far, 11,500 have been considered to be impacted by pollution. And this graph shows uh, where the main threat is pollution. It may actually be even larger than climate change. And it may change over time, but really gives a sense of why have we not been talking about pollution uh, and, um, and its links to, to health and biodiversity. I'd like to give you one example about this in practice and what it means. Um, and this example is from the island of Madagascar, where Q has been working since the 1980s. And it's a fantastic place. Um, I, I've just been there and not, not, not very long, but uh, what you see is a huge diversity of species that are only found that the endemic to Madagascar. But on the other hand, there are huge socioeconomic challenges. Uh, it's the country that is poorest and not at war at the moment and uh, 28 million people where poverty is the cause, the main cause of conservation uh, challenges in, on the island. What we did last month was to publish two review papers in the general science where 
we basically compi compiled all information about what we know in terms of biodiversity for both plants and animals. And we also, also use some AI to fill up the gaps in terms of the threats to different species. So on the left hand, hand side here, you see the, the black line in the middle, which cuts uh, the species that are threatened uh, on the bottom from those that are not threatened uh, up here. So you see that a large proportion of species are considered to be threatened. In fact, 90% of all plant species in Madagascar have some sort of threat and sometimes several. What we can do with this data by connecting uh, the, the threats to species, we can actually also link the causes of that. And the drivers are multiple. We know out of the, um, the information we just heard uh, from Anne and others that agriculture and land use change are the number one cause of threats and, and biodiversity loss. Uh, everywhere, but also Madagascar. But I just want to highlight the importance here of mining and energy production, because mining is an activity that, that is really tightly linked to the release of chemicals and pollutants, but also has a direct impact uh, on biodiversity by changing uh, the land use where those species are found. So this is something that is affecting lots of different groups of plants, and we're seeing the same effects on animals as well. So in terms of solution, what can we do? We've heard some of that before, but I just want to focus uh, on the fact that we actually have some interesting technologies and data uh, to take action. So, for instance, uh, we've been working quite a bit on, in terms of identifying the 30 by 30 that Anne uh, and others talked about. Where, where do we protect is a very difficult question. So, for instance, now we're using uh, information from remote sensing, so satellite images and other technologies, and artificial intelligence to help us identify the top priorities for conservation. And that's going to be really critical because that's where we can add values such as uh, carbon storage and other metrics that are important to people and societies. We're also providing guidelines for restoration. We also heard from Anne uh, the potential negative impact of doing tree planting without using the best available science. And we have seen many examples where, um, you know, initiatives plant exotic trees which has a negative impact on water supplies, uh, on biodiversity, on chemical leakage. And we've identified 10 set of very simple golden rules based on the best science about how to go about in terms of restoration and in particular reforestation, which will benefit uh, biodiversity, climate uh, and the livelihoods of uh, people living there. So in conclusion, I think that it is uh, a very exciting time because we know that nature can help us uh, in tackling these three crises I mentioned. Uh, there, is, there will be, of course, a lot of um, importance for technological advancements, but nature does work. We know that trees are extremely effective in capturing and restoring carbon, for instance, and also the many benefits of investing on nature and restoring it. Uh, we also uh, are in a situation where we have very exciting technologies in, in terms of AI, uh, remote sensing. So we have the, the methods and the data. We can't blame that because we know what to do, we just have to act. And I think in order for this to realize, joining forces is absolutely essential. So I'm very pleased to see the many international participants to this conference today uh, and the different views that have been put forward. Uh, and with that, I just want to also mention that I've just published a book, if anyone would be interested in hearing more about the links between uh, biodiversity, climate uh, and, and pollution. And I think that uh, when it comes to climate change, when it comes to planetary health and one health, I think there's a huge opportunity here, but we have to seize it, as we've heard before. So those were my considerations, and I hope that there'll be a nice discussion, and also you'll have a good lunch in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. That was marvellous. Um, really, uh, such an important uh, point towards those nature-based solutions, and uh, I'm sure colleagues would love to, to read the, the book and hear more about that really interesting use of artificial intelligence. That's uh, marvellous uh, work. So, colleagues, I am actually very conscious that you have all been sitting here for a good few hours uh, at this point. Um, we are going to have the chance to unpack many of the issues that we've spoken about in this uh, session and in the previous uh, sessions. We'll unpack all of that over the course of uh, the next few days. So I do actually want to, to bring us to a close, but I do want to ask each of the, the panel members really for one, 
one sentence really that's going to allow us to leave this room uh, with action not just sort of individually focused but action that we can take within our organizations uh, within the, the big institutions in which we are uh, located what what are we we going to to do so um Alexandra, I'm going to start with you because you've been uh, sitting very quietly uh, listening uh, in the background. So just following on from your remarks, one sentence, one thing that you want us to take with us as we go into lunch. Um, I, th I think the key message for me at least is that we all should be talking more about um, these issues. And the more we talk, the, the easier it will be to convince our families, our companies, our politicians and policymakers uh, so we, I think we need to be difficult. We need to challenge the status quo. And I think this is a role that we all, all can play, not least the scientists. And I think we need to leave our bubble of academic um, you know, freedom and reach out to society much more. So I'm actually optimistic. Lovely. Thank you. Abigail. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we, we have these very ambitious goals and we have them not solely because we, we want to be ambitious, but because the situation that we're in necessitates these ambitious goals. And uh, the ambassador would have said that progress is slow, but do we really have the ability or the opportunity to, to move so slowly towards these goals? And I think that's, that, that's where I'll end. I think that it's easy to be overwhelmed. It looks too difficult, too big, too complicated. But my appeal and ask today is for PMAC to lead us and set the agenda. We want the health community to come together as a conclusion and work on the three positive tipping points in the health sector that we need to work towards that will actually see us shift and achieve you know, better outcomes for our planet. I would say for, for us as the European Union, um, what we need to do is to continue what we're doing, to continue de developing policies like our deforestation policy, like our IUU policy. We also need to continue to reach out and be a strong part of the international discussion on these issues. Um, and our position on these is very clear in relation to uh, combating climate change and biodiversity loss and environmental degradation. Um, this is a long-term battle where there is no room for any complacency. Thank you. Thank you. So colleagues, please join me in thanking our panelists, our speakers, all of the interactions, amazing, thank you. So with no further ado, Please let's adjourn for lunch and keep the conversation going. <laughs>